all of your resources are now for um, for everything related to the project, but specifically to lesson planning as well. So I just wanted to go um, through the steps it takes to get to our template so you know where that is, and then the steps to get to the form so you know where that is to submit, and then go over the actual lesson plan template with all of you. Um, so from the home page, if you go to the frequently asked questions, I was going to pull up these various questions here. I'm going to go to the first one that talks about lesson plans. What kind of lesson plans do I need to submit? I'm going to open this one up. And you'll see right here, the first bullet point um, says that your lesson plan needs to be submitted with Google Slides and that there's a template and it's located right here. So if you click this link, it's gonna pull up this slide deck. Now we're gonna to look to make a, a little tweak to this process so that when you click on that link, it'll automatically have you make a copy of the slide deck. And the copy of the slide deck will then be what you can edit. Because right now, if you open this up and you're not, me or one of the other admins, you can't edit this, which is intentional, right? Because that's our template. And so right now your process, once the template is open, is to go up to file and make a copy of the entire presentation. And when you click on that, you can name it, whatever the name of your lesson plan is, it'll go into your Google Drive and you hit make a copy. And that'll allow you then to edit the slides, add your text, add your pictures, all that stuff. So we're, we're going to work on making that happen automatically. But for the moment, again, you go to the website, we went to frequently asked questions, what kind of lesson plans do I need to submit, we drop that down. And then we click the link to the slide template. Okay, so it's kind of the process of getting there. A lot of you have already submitted lessons. So you know that you've got a copy of it already. But if you haven't, that's the process. So we're gonna take a, a little bit of a deeper look into the template now. And then the great thing about the website being live is we can also look at some lesson plans that have been submitted and approved already um, and see how the template is transformed into an actual lesson plan. So the first slide's real simple. All you need to do on this slide is add your lesson title. So you're gonna click on this, you're gonna highlight it, you're gonna make your title. I'm actually gonna get out of the template just in case I accidentally make any edits. So I'm making a copy of the template. And if you don't change the name, it'll just say copy of template. Um, and so if you go here and you say STEM lesson title, right? So whatever it is, whether it's drones or robots or um, frogs, whatever your, your lesson plan title is, it goes there. Um, this little piece down here says intro slide. That's just a note for you. You can delete that. Um, if not, I'll delete it when it comes to me. Uh, second slide gets us a little bit more information. We're going to put the lesson title again. They can be the same title. They, they could be, should be the same title um, for your lesson. Uh, so just go ahead and put that in again. And then you're going to put in your grade that this lesson is for. It could be one grade, could be more. So it could be like a fifth grade STEM lesson plan, or it could be fifth and sixth grade, or whatever, whatever it fits. It could be K-8 or K-12, whatever the range is that's appropriate. Where it says author, you're going to put in your name and the date. You're going to just put in the date that you're creating the lesson plan, right? So it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, again, these are notes to you of what to do, and you can just delete those notes. You can leave them. It doesn't matter. I'll delete them when it comes to me. And that's it. So those are your, like your a pair of title slides. One's just an intro. It's for people who download this. They know it came from ASAP, right? It came from the Arizona STEM Acceleration Project. And this is truly the first slide of the lesson plan where you have the title, who it's by, when it was submitted, and what grade it's for. So then moving on, um, our, our next slide is uh, two pieces. One is notes. So to be real clear, the notes are an important piece that you, as someone who has done this lesson before, is sharing little pieces of information with um, a new teacher. So I, I like to imagine that the person who downloads this has never taught this before, has never taught STEM before. They're a first year teacher, you know, first year teachers, they sometimes they don't have all the pieces together about how lessons run and pacing. And so this is just an opportunity for us to say, listen, this is great if you, you can put, this should be done in groups of two or groups of four. This should be done in a classroom or outside, or this is great for a STEM club, right? Little notes that don't, often show up in a lesson plan, but are really helpful for someone who downloads this. Or it might be, this is great to kick off an ecology unit, or this is a great summative five-week project on volcanoes, whatever it is, right? Just a little tidbit there that you're adding for those teachers because they don't know this lesson plan. They've never seen it before. 
um, and they may not have never done STEM before. So that's the note side. The material side, pretty self-explanatory. List all the materials needed. If you have something that is unusual or maybe most teachers won't have, it can be really helpful to link that. So what I've seen a lot is it'll say something like hydroponics kit, which is fine because for me, I'm like, oh, I know what hydroponics is. I know what these kits look like. I'm going to go to Amazon or I'm going to go to you know Carolina Biological or wherever I'm going to go and I'm going to find the hydroponics kit. But it's also nice if you can turn this into a link. And so you just highlight it and you go to insert and then you would copy and paste your link. Let's say it's to Amazon right in here so that when I'm, I'm a new teacher now and I download your lesson, I can just click on it and say, oh, this is the kit they used. Doesn't mean I have to, but at least it gives me an idea. So if you're using a specific kind of robot or a wind turbine kit, right? So in one of my lessons, it's for wind turbines. And so then I would go kid wind and I would find the kit that I use. Let's see here. And it's, uh, yeah, use this one, right? And it doesn't have to be the specific product, but something where I'm gonna grab, I'm like, okay, this will work. This is a classroom pack for a teacher. I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna click link and I'm gonna paste it in there. So now when a new teacher downloads this lesson plan, they can click on that and then they'll be like, oh, okay, this is what he's talking about. This is the wind turbine kit, okay? So definitely um, something to consider when you're doing your materials list. If it's like paper plates, marbles, right? You don't need to do that. But anytime there's something special in your lesson plan, you know, adding a link can be really helpful. So your, your materials list goes there and some notes. Um, this section down here, you can delete all of it, or if there's anything else you want to add, you can add notes to the teacher. These notes that are in the template are from me to you as the person writing the lesson plan. So the actual teacher who's going to use this um, doesn't necessarily need to see those. Okay. Next slide, standards. The minimum is one standard from STEM. So it could be a science standard, a tech standard, an engineering standard, or a math standard. You can put 20 standards on this page if it's a big project and that's what's appropriate. That's fantastic. But the minimum is one from those areas. You can have ELA standards, you can have art standards, you can have PE standards. However, those must be in addition to at least one standard from STEM. Okay. If you have any difficulty finding standards, just send me an email and say, hey, this is an engineering project. Arizona doesn't have engineering standards. I'll be like, I know, that's crazy, but here are some options. Next Generation Science Standard has engineering standards. Arizona has high school CTE engineering standards. We'll, we'll find a way to make it work. Um, the full standard is helpful. So if we go to Arizona Science Standards, right, and if you spell it right, it'll pull up. ADE's website, and then we're gonna go down here, and let's say we're working with middle school because that's what I taught for years, and I'm gonna look at the middle school standards on PDF, right? So I'm gonna, it's a long document. I'm gonna scroll down. I've looked in this a lot recently, and let's say I go to sixth grade. These are standards along the left side, right? So you have the standard code six, P1, physical science, uh, core idea for understanding one, right? So you have this, um this these standards what i've seen sometimes is that people copy these these are the core ideas those are great to include also but you need to have at least one standard so it could be a science standard could be a math standard tech standard engineering standard right and so you can just just copy and paste this right and go back to your lesson plan and put it in there it helps to include the code too um that way someone can kind of know like what they're working on and if it's a little tweaked, uh, you know, a little bit off on the, the formatting, then I'll just clean that up when I get it. But um, all of this makes it more efficient if it's in that, that format when it comes to me. If you only have standards on the left, feel free to delete the boxes on the right, right? Like this is, this is your lesson plan to manipulate. We're giving you the template and the theme so that they all look the same, but the content is yours. So one of the questions is like, can you add extra slides? Yeah, absolutely. If you've got a bunch of standards, one option is just duplicate the slide, right? As you just right click on it, Go to duplicate and now there's two standard slides and then I go here and maybe I'm doing math standards. 
and I'm going to list my math standards. And over here, I have ELA standards. So this is yours to make of it what's most appropriate for your lesson. You can absolutely add slides in here. What's here is the minimum, right? Anything beyond that is acceptable. It's encouraged. Um, but the minimum is what's listed in the template. So when you got all your standards listed out, the next step are your objectives. Again, you need one as a minimum. But if it's like a multi-day project, it might have more than one objective. And that's great. So you can list those here. And again, the notes at the bottom, these are called speaker notes. You know, Please include one or more objectives for your lesson. That's from me to you as the author. So after you've added your objectives, I'm just going to get rid of that because the teacher doesn't need to see that. Um, so list your objective, right? Today, students will turn wind into electricity or whatever the case may be, whatever your objective format is. I'm not too concerned. You can use any objective format you want because a teacher is gonna probably have to translate that into their school or district's version anyway, but it's, it's helpful to have those objectives. Next slide, agenda. Um, I'm gonna go up here. I'm gonna say, oh, this lesson takes about 60 minutes, right? Maybe it's an hour long and it's real simple, like intro to wind, read, the boy who harnessed the wind and then uh, create wind turbines, reflect, right? And that, that can be it. It can be the four things, the four big things. It, it's meant to be a short little agenda. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be one standard per slide. You can put 10 standards on one slide if it'll fit. But if it's like all squished together and the font is size six and you can't read it, then yeah, definitely duplicate it and, and put one more. So whatever looks good to you uh, as the author is fine. You don't have to do one per slide. You can do more um, so that, yeah, either way. So you've got your agenda done. You're moving on. Uh, <laughs> this is a funny slide. So the way I wrote this was, so you can either include an introduction, a driving question, or an opening activity. Uh, in my mind, I was like, oh, they'll delete the ones that don't apply but most people just leave all three which is fine but if you're starting off with like a driving question right which is something that comes from pbl and it might be something like you know how, how do we turn wind into electricity then that's that's good or you can just use intros kind of like that generic one whatever you're doing to kick off the lesson it could be a thought question this could be a video it could be a link to a song, especially with younger students. It could be, hey, do a read aloud. Whatever your intro activity is to kind of get students' attention. You know, sometimes they call it anticipatory set. Some people call it bell work. Whatever you do to kick off the lesson, it can be it can be anything. Um, and so that's kind of the purpose, the purpose of that slide. And again, this is a note to you, so I can delete that. The hands-on activity, right? It's like the most important part of the lesson plan. Like, what are the kids doing? And there have been a lot of questions about, like, do they have to be physically touching something? Like, no, I mean, hands-on, you know, that's a, a generic term we use, but sometimes people have them doing virtual simulations, right? So FET, P-H-E-T, great site, all sorts of science simulations. That could be your hands-on activity. Um, but what the purpose of this is, is to remind you that this should not be a teacher talking and a student listening to a lecture for 60 minutes, right? Like, that's what we're avoiding here, and that's really not how STEM is intended to be uh, engaged with by students. So what are you doing? What are the students doing to engage with the content? Um, if you have a, a multi-lesson unit, you can email me and say, hey, listen, my second and third units, we're building wind turbines, but the first one we're doing research, we're watching a video, we're... Just, just reach out to me if you're not going to have a, a super hands-on piece. It's a little different if it's part of a unit rather than a standalone lesson. If it's a standalone lesson, I'm, I'm going to say no. There needs to be a hands-on component. If it's part of a unit, we can, we can see. As long as the kids are engaged and active, then we can be uh, flexible with that part. Uh, but there should be, it's STEM, right? It should be hands-on. Students should be doing something. Once you've got the hands-on activity, and again, this might be a place where you have multiple slides, it'd be great if you can include a picture of what this looks like. If your students are in it, make sure that you have their faces blocked. Um, it's funny, sometimes people will send in a picture of their students and they'll put little black circles over their faces. But if you move the picture at all, 
the, the black dots don't go with the picture. <laughs> so uh, that's okay. I, I have a really simple fix for that. I just take a, a, a picture of your picture with the black dots over them, and then someone can't accidentally reveal their faces. It's really not a big deal usually. Um, but if you have a picture of how the setup goes or what it looks like, um, there was one where someone was making a car out of like toilet paper rolls, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, a picture would be great here. So the teacher at least has an idea of what the finished product might look like. Um, or it could be a picture of the setup, but a picture goes a long way to help. Again, I, I try to imagine a brand new teacher who has no idea what they're doing with STEM saying, wow, this was so helpful. I knew exactly how this was supposed to look when it was set up or when the students were done. As always, we want to have some sort of assessment piece in here. This is an opportunity for you to make suggestions. It doesn't mean whoever downloads this is going to use your assessment idea. You know, and for a lot of like engineering activities, like did it work? You know, so it might be, did the wind turbine produce electricity, right? That can be an assessment question. And then it might be, how much were they able to improve the amount, right? And so it can be things like that. It can also be like, here's a link to a Kahoot where you can use an online quiz to help assess this. What we found with Kahoot and quizzes and all those things is just, again, make sure that the public can access them, make sure they're public. Um, so whoever clicks on that link can actually get to your Kahoot. It can be, hey, this is a great opportunity for a poster, a video, a podcast, a, um, a flip grid, which is now called flip, which is a great opportunity to do um, voiceover screencasts or videos. You can do all the settings. It's really great. It's intended for school, so it's pretty secure. Um, but whatever you're suggesting for assessment for this lesson goes on this slide. And again, if you need more than one slide, you can. Um, on my one of my example lesson plans, there's STEM assessment and ELA assessment. And a couple of people thought the ELA assessment was a requirement. It's not at all. But if you happen to have an integrated lesson, that's great. You know, you can certainly do that. Um, again, minimum is one. Give us at least one good idea for that teacher to know how to assess this. Sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes it's not. So I'm uh, just gonna include that. If there's more than one option, that's really helpful too. And then you're onto your last slide already, differentiation. Uh, this is a really important piece because we know that our students in our classrooms come to us in very unique ways with very unique uh, sets of skills and abilities. And we wanna make sure that as many students can access this as possible. And so, my example for this with the wind turbine project might be provide templates for first wind turbine blades, right? So give them a template, help them get started. That might be a sense of remediation, or it might be provide specific angles to test. So you have to put the wind turbine blades on at different angles, and you can provide those angles to the students to test that. So there's just different ways that maybe make it a little more accessible. Students are doing the same project. It's a little easier to, to get on board and get started. Extension enrichment is the opposite. It was like these kids, they get it. They're, they're capable. Maybe they've done it before. Maybe they're just really good at this particular topic. How can they go deeper? How can they go further with this? Um, and it might be something like, you know, what would it take to charge your cell phone with your wind turbine, right? And that requires this whole other level of understanding of like, well, this is producing direct current, not AC current. Like, is that okay? Because AC current is what's coming out of the wall. And how much would it take to charge a phone? And what's the voltage? What's the amperage? And so it's really an opportunity for students to go a lot deeper with this, but they're still working on the same project. And it's interesting, like, a lot of middle schoolers, like, they want to know if they can charge their phone with this. Like, that'd be cool. Um, it shouldn't just be more work. So we try to avoid that. It's not like, give them 10 more questions to solve, right? Like, something engaging that they can go deeper with it. What I do with this slide when I review them is I click on it and I click skip. Just so that the students, if I were using this with students, they don't see that slide um, when you go into presentation mode. So if I go like, oh, agenda, driving question, hands-on activity, assessment, that's it. It doesn't go to the differentiation slide because it's skipped. Um, that way we don't want our students to ever feel like, oh, those are like special just for me that I didn't have to do that. And that's it. So there's actually nine pieces to the lesson plan. There's the title, the notes and materials, standards, objectives, agenda, 
your, your intro, right? How are you starting? Hands-on activity, assessment, and differentiation. So there's nine pieces. So um, the minimum that you could ever turn in is 10 slides because there's two title slides, um, but there's no maximum. I've had 30 slide lessons. I've had longer, um, and that's that's great. That's fine. Uh, there's You don't get more points or less points, right? Like You're not getting the grade for this, but um, we just want it to be well done and thorough. And so we have a, a set minimum, and then you take that and you add on what other extra pieces you may need. So you can definitely add additional slides. Um, we do ask that you leave the theme alone. So like ASU's maroon and gold, uh, we leave that alone. We leave the imagery alone on these slides um, just because uh, we want these to be uh, recognizable as having come from this project, right? And so we want that to be something that we're putting out there. Um, when we get lesson plans in from other groups, like the Arizona Educational Foundation, theirs are like purple and teal. They they have their own format. And I know because I wrote that template too. <laughs> so um, there's there's some you know clear cut uh, expectations with the lesson plans. And then the content is entirely up to you. Okay. A um, couple of other things to note. Speaking of content, these are STEM lesson plans. STEM is traditionally composed of science, technology, engineering, and math you must have at least two of those components in your lesson, right? Um, that means what I see the most of that don't do that are science lesson plans. I'll, I'll get, I've probably had 20 or 30 out of 400 where really it's just a science lesson plan. And I taught science for 10 years and I love science and science is everywhere and it's great. However, for this particular project, we're going further, we're going deeper. So the simplest way to, to kind of step it up from there is to implement a piece of technology with a science lesson plan in terms of how the students are either interacting with the content or demonstrating what they know. So adding an element of like, you're gonna do this science project and study and it's hands-on and it's great. And then you're gonna create a video to talk about it. Okay, great. Now you're implementing that educational technology piece. Um, so that's kind of a, a simpler way to do that. Um, but it could be science and math. It could be tech and engineering. It could be engineering and science. It could be tech and math. Any combination, and it, of course, can have more than two. If you could put all four elements in in a meaningful way, that is, that's the pinnacle, right? Gold star for having all four pieces. And if you can work the art in and it's a STEAM lesson plan, I mean, you're just knocking it out of the park. So we, we set minimums, not maximums. You need to have at least two different content areas from STEM included. It doesn't have to be represented in your standards. Like you don't have to have a science standard and a math standard, but it must be part of the activity, right? If that makes sense. So if you're doing, uh, I'm trying to think of one that I saw recently, um, a lot of stuff about habitats, about animals, they're mostly science, but then there has to be another piece. So sometimes it's math, like looking at populations, looking at statistics, graphing. Those are great ways to implement math into STEM. It doesn't mean you need to have a math standard, you might just have a science standard, but there's meaningful math in the lesson plan. Um, and so that's kind of the, the opportunity to, to integrate. That's the whole purpose of STEM is that this content is integrated, okay? So that's, that's the basic run through. The nice thing is now, if you go to our website and you go to the STEM lesson plans and you click on all, you can see all of the lesson plans that have been approved and published. Right? And there's a few pages up here. Um, there will be hundreds more coming in the near future uh, as I get the ones that have been approved, imported into the website and published as well. You can search by keyword, you can search by grade level, you can search by content or a combination. So if you put in robot, you're gonna get lesson plans, right? So there's these five that pop up related to robotics and robots. And it's a little smart, even though I said robots and not robotics, it'll pull these up. Um, so there's lots of different ways to search and this database will of course be growing greatly over the next weeks and months uh, as we get into the summer. So if you're like, oh, I have this idea, I'm not really sure, go see if there's some lesson plans similar, right? Out there already. Um, and you can kind of base it off of that, of what's out there that's been accepted and published. When you're ready to submit your lesson plan, go to the website, go up here to STEM lesson plans and click on submit a lesson plan. This is the same exact format as our Google form. So if you already did some, it's the same thing. First and last name, email. It's helpful if you use the same email every time. So we, we would appreciate that. And it's an email address you can access. That's also helpful. Um, 
title of your lesson plan, the description, as it says here, is please provide a short preview of the lesson. Uh, it's going to be included. So this is what shows up here as the description, as this lesson summary, right? And so uh, it's helpful that it's concise and it makes sense. It's like this lesson plan is like, what is it? Like if I'm a teacher and I'm looking for a lesson plan, it's going to immediately tell me what I'm looking for. Uh, the link. So when you're all done, right, we're all done with our lesson, we're going to go to share in this upper right hand corner. It's really, <laughs> this is really important uh, where it says restricted. I'm going to click on anyone with the link. Just needs to be on view. Safer if it just says views and no one else is going to accidentally edit your lesson. Then you click on copy link. I can click done. Go back here. I'm going to paste this. Right, and then it just goes in there. What I'm gonna do as the reviewer is I'm gonna open your slide deck and pretty much the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a copy of it into the ASU Google Drive. That way no one, including me, is going to accidentally edit your lesson plan. And if at some point you no longer have access to your Google Drive, the lesson plan doesn't disappear off the website. So you don't have to worry about that at any point. Um, no, Rob, there is very few on the website, even amongst those that have been approved. So that I'm not waiting for that in particular, but we were, it, it's been a process. They'll, they'll get up there soon. Uh, how long is it taking to get plans approved? So yeah, some days I get 30 lesson plans submitted on the same day and they can take up to 10 minutes to go through and review. So, you know, six hours of lessons in one day <laughs> submitted. Um, usually five to seven business days, they're reviewed. Um, and then the way I've been doing it is sending out batches of emails that say, hey, listen, you've got two lesson plans approved. And it, there's a note in there, it says like, if you've submitted more than two, I will let you know about those later. Um, so that's that's been the, the time frame right now. We're in the middle of transitioning from using the Google form to the website. So it's been a little bit slower than usual. Once we get completely transitioned over to just using the site, hopefully that'll go faster. Files, articles, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot of different ways. So one is if it's a Google Doc or if it's a Word Doc, you can put in Google Docs. That's the easiest because then you can go to like your list of materials and you can just say, come on. I meant if it's documents. a PDF. Yeah, if it's a PDF, same thing if you put it in your Google Drive, you can actually share a link. If that's like a process and it's not comfortable for you, you just email it to me and say, hey, this goes with this lesson plan. And I will put it, I will put the PDF in the ASU Google Drive and link it into your lesson plan. So either way, easiest for me is if it's linked in here, PDF, Google Docs, Slide Deck, doesn't matter. Um, but if that's, you know, sometimes that can be a hassle depending on your school and your Google Drive and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so if it's easier, you can also just shoot me an email and say, hey, this goes with the copy of template ASAP lesson plan or whatever the title is, and I'll get it added. Yeah. Yeah, you can put it down in the notes as well, those links. It just depends. Sometimes it's like um, in the materials list, sometimes it'll be like, oh, this is part of the hands-on activity, and I'll see links in the, the uh, speaker notes down here. Also, you said something about cahoots or quizzes. Um, do I have to mention that you have to create an account for quizzes or, or, I mean, people would understand that, right? Yeah. I mean, when they click on the link, it's going to say, you need to create an account. So you don't have to. I mean, we're we're just trying to at least put kind of a minimum um, ease of access out there. But yeah, if it's something like some people were using links to discovery education, you have to have an account for that. Like, that's okay. Um, if that's a great resource, then that's fine. And if they want to create it, they will. And if they don't, they won't. So yeah, that, that's fine. You don't need to put anything extra. Um, no, you can't submit it through the Google form anymore because the Google form is closed. So you have to go um, to the website and use this one. But the, this was built based on the Google form. So it should be identical to the Google form. Uh, so hopefully that um, is a simple transition for you. Uh, we've probably had maybe 50 people that have had all four done and they've gotten their confirmation email. Um, but again, I'm probably caught up, what's the 27th? 
I'm right around the 20th of April in terms of submission date. So if you submitted on the 20th or more recently, then you wouldn't have gotten email uh, for all four yet. Uh, da -da, citations for YouTube internet pictures. Mm, not for YouTube. Some people, when they include a picture, they'll say, you know, picture from, and they include the link. We have a lot more flexibility in education for fair use than in something for profit or something that's, you know, going to go out there in other ways. So I I don't necessarily have the, the, the bandwidth and the time to check the source to see if it was open source or see if it was Creative Commons licensed. It's great if they're, yeah, royalty-free Creative Commons licensed images or if you include the link. Beyond that, I'm, you know, I'm not in a position to check and I don't think we're going to have an issue with that because it's not for profit and for educational use. Um. Do you need, do we need to have like things, other components like vocabulary and all of that somewhere, or is that not necessary? Like, just depends on the lesson. I would say 40% of lessons, 30% have had explicit vocabulary in there. It's not a requirement. Um, it just depends on, you know, what you think is most important for that lesson. And so, yeah. And if it is like from a certain curriculum and somebody already asked this question, like maybe it's from, you know, like Pearson or whatever curriculum that we're using, that's going to, is that going to be a problem? Um, it depends on what it is. So my, my thought on that is if the activity is inspired by something that came out of your school curriculum, that's fine. If it's, a hundred percent the activity right out of your Pearson textbook like that we can't do right so if that makes sense um it yeah I mean again we want to make this accessible it's one thing if it's like this is a dollar 99 on teachers pay teachers it's another thing if like this is from a Pearson curriculum that costs ten thousand dollars for your district right in terms of whether or not a teacher can access it um it would be preferable if the lesson plan is something that you're creating based on content that comes from somewhere else rather than this is an exact activity from Pearson or from uh, a FOSS kit or, or something along those lines. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, that, that's fine, Sonia. If you have things that are connected, that's a standalone lesson, but it also connects. Sure, because maybe other people have that same curriculum and that's nice for them to know. Um, thanks for putting that link in the chat. That is the link to submit lesson plans. Yeah, the Google form is probably still up. Uh, I'm not sure if it's active. It's supposed to give you a message to go to the website. Well, I, I, that's not my area, so I haven't double checked that, but um, we should hopefully be all transitioning over and using the website. And it did go out as an email. Yeah, so I mean, if um, I've seen a lot of the high school teachers using like open source textbook links, uh, that's fine. If it's content that's available for free, yeah, definitely link to it. Um, so like when I created my demo lesson plan from Kidwind, they have a whole set of lesson ideas and activities. You can do a whole unit for six to nine weeks on it, and it's all free. That's 100% okay. Um, but what we don't want is copied and pasted uh, content that comes from another resource, right? We don't wanna be like, oh, this is my lesson plan. And when I look at it, the content is word for word from another resource. Um, so that that kind of thing, you can link to it, but you can't include it as if it's your own lesson. Um, the project is not my area. However, <laughs> I'm not sure if, you know, there'll be too much of a conversation about that today. I know that that's something that's gonna be going out um, in terms of the details of it. I'm not sure if Amanda wants to chime in. I know she's here, but. Um... Yeah, I, I can speak to that. So when we are, sorry guys, I'm not feeling so well, so I'm gonna leave my, my video off. But um, the, the original idea was that we would have this, you would have this project that you're doing in your classroom. You're buying materials for this project. You're writing up lesson plans about this project, a student facing project. Now that's not maybe how your year has gone. That's not how the funding has allowed it to work. That's not how the, the 
PDs that you've gone to, you know, maybe you're waiting for the summer to do your PDs. So basically your project is just, what did you do with your students? So these four lesson plans are your best. These are a resource that we are sharing with Arizona, that we're sharing with our, our other fellows. And um, you know, it's, it's a deliverable from the project. We have these four lesson plans. But the project is just what you're writing about in your final report that we're gonna be sending out the, the form for in a couple of weeks. Um, and the project is just like, what did you do with your students? What is, how did you incorporate more STEM into your classroom? Are you a language arts teacher and you know you read this book and you did this hands-on STEM project with your students? Were you a PE teacher and you um, you know were, were collecting some data about your soccer you know uh, semester or uh, your soccer uh, quarter that you were working on? Um, you know, was it in your science classroom and you had, never done, um, you know, your, you had some, maybe some big labs that you'd never tried before. You wanted to move it out from a textbook and actually do a hands-on lab with your students. So that is just going to be summarized for us. We have uh, a form that we're creating that we're going to be sending out from, uh, it's not going to be in Google Form. Hopefully, everything will be transitioning over to both the website and to um, UOEEE that you guys have been getting emails from. Um, and they will send it out, and it will just ask you, like, what did you do with your students? What were the hand? What was the hands-on project? You know, it could be related to these lesson plans that you're doing, or it could not. Does that make sense? Is that uh, yeah? Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah, I just wanted to, I was just wondering if this project could be because of the funding and the timeline as I received it, could it be my plan for next year? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. I've been trying to remember to say that to everybody as well, because, you know, even if things had worked perfectly with your funding or or whatever, whatever had happened, you know, sometimes people have situations in their classroom or at their school where like, you know, I have this great plan, but I couldn't do it this year, but we want to know what your plan is for next year. And that's a hundred percent fine as well. Yeah. Maybe this year was all about prep. Maybe this year was all about like getting into the mindset, thinking about these lesson plans, buying materials. And now I have a solid plan ready to go into next year. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking about plan, I know I'm supposed to submit receipt receipts for the money that we have received. So mm -hmm. does that mean I should already have purchased the materials before July? The yeah, before July 31st, yes, we need to see uh what those receipts are and it's just it's for the $2000. That's it. Um I had a couple of questions about that recently because you did get $2500 in that first check um and but remember that $500 is just for your incidentals. Um, and so we're just looking for about, about $2,000 worth of materials for your classroom. The rest of the money is for you, uh, either as a stipend or for, you know, any other, um, uh, costs incurred during the program. Um, and I know this is a very specific question for the funding, but can we buy books with that money? I mean, that's up to you. Uh, uh, absolutely. We we definitely want things that are going to be able to be used over multiple years. And if it's, uh, you know, a book that is, you know, going along with your your STEM project, if it's supporting what you're doing in your classroom, if it's, you know, booklets for a, a STEM night or whatever it is. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so to... Uh, let's see. I've got another question. What if we spent the whole thing on materials? That's totally up to you. That's, that's, I mean, it doesn't matter to us. You can give us the receipts for all uh, the money that you spent. That's totally fine. Um, we just, again, we have a minimum that we're looking for maximum. I mean, you guys are all, you know, maximum. <laughs> uh, Amanda, for yeah. the receipts, when it's time to turn in our receipts, would we turn in pictures of each individual receipt or like a spreadsheet? 
Great question. Um, we are in the process of figuring that out. I will have a better answer for you uh, on Monday. Um, the answer is we want to make it as easy as possible on you. So it's possible that we'll just have you go in and shove whatever pictures or PDFs or screenshots or whatever into a Google Drive, or we might have you put it into a um, a spreadsheet. I'm just we're right at the point where we're making that decision so that we can get that that report finalized. I've been doing both in my Google Drive, just taking a picture of the receipt and then also putting it on a spreadsheet so I can watch my spending. You're so. fantastic. That's amazing. Yeah, that's I was a great just idea. Trying to keep organized because it's been kind <laughs> of a hectic year with all the PD and the extra stuff. I bet. Yeah, absolutely. And and we appreciate you. We know you guys have all done a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of stuff this year. You always do a lot of stuff, but um, and I am in the process right now. Shala and I are sort of uh, emailing back and forth right now. We have a bunch of the summer workshops that are being released right now. Some really amazing stuff um, that I'm super excited about that's happening uh, over the summer. Some four day workshops, some two week workshops. So if you are available for those things, um, those things are going to be emailed out to you here either today or tomorrow. So uh, year two for fellows. Jonathan, do you mind if I just keep answering these questions? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, year two looks like for fellows. So um, we've been mentioning this from the beginning and it's been like everything else with this project. You know, we, we trust you as professionals um, and we have to just give you the information as we have it. So with year two, we know that everyone is going to need to reapply for the fellowship. And our intention is that if you are a fellow in good standing, um, that you will be able to be in year two of the project. That has always been the intention. Now, the reality of that, what that looks like, depends entirely on our amount of funding how many fellows finish the project or how many fellows end and are paid the full amount. Um, you know, we have, we have very tight margins in terms of uh, how, uh, how we can spend this money. So we will be making those decisions in August. So we will wrap up on July 31st. You guys will all apply here um, in the next couple of months. We'll send out information about that as well. And, um, uh, our intention is that everyone who is a fellow in good standing will be able to continue. However, please understand that we may not be able to take everyone for next year. And I don't want anyone to feel like, oh, it's because my lesson plan wasn't good enough, or it was because, you know, like, oh, my application wasn't good enough. That is not what this is about. As always, we will be looking at whether you recoup finished the requirements. That's one thing. But we also have to take into consideration geography. We also have to take into consideration you know, your student population and your type of location. And there's some things for the grant that we have to balance as well. So um, my hope is that everyone who will be who finishes year one will be able to go into year two. And if that's not the case, I don't want anyone to just be like, oh my God, I didn't do it right. That's that's not what this is about. Um, so year two will start in uh, end of August. And then hopefully it will be less of a cram for you guys because it will be the same requirements, but you will have several months more to complete it. <laughs> it will be, uh, and also all of the professional development organizations will have their um their schedules from this last year, and many of them will just be duplicating them for next year. So you will know way in advance um, what sessions are available so that you can plan ahead. I know for a lot of people, we've just been releasing things as our partners have been giving them to us. Um, and that's stressful for a lot of people because they're like, am I going to be able to get all these hours? And we're like, there's more coming. There's more coming. I promise. <laughs> So, um, and like I said, a lot of things are being released now um, as these organizations, a lot of them are teacher run organizations. And so, you know, they're trying to wrap up their, their years and then get the summer ready for you guys. So 
Um, that is that is kind of a general idea for year two. Anything more specific you wanted to know? Okay, looks like we're good. Um, how will we know if our 30 hours of PD are approved? Um, we kind of like Jonathan, we've been doing them in batches and we've been sending out um, we've been sending out uh, updates with to people when they reach certain milestones. Um, if you are asking for approval on some PD ahead of time, um, then that's a conversation that you have to email uh, at STEM teachers. Uh, at the at the email address and Shala will get back to you. Um, but like I said, hopefully there's not too much reason to go outside of the partners because if it's provided by a partner, you don't have to worry about it being approved. It's automatically approved. Um, you only have to worry about approval if you're like, uh, if you're thinking like, I just, I can't find what I need or it's just absolutely not fitting with my schedule. So um, for the majority of people, you shouldn't have to worry about your hours getting approved because you're taking hours through the PD partners and you uh, it's it's pre-approved. Uh, and I've... somebody asked this in the chat and I'm just voicing it and because I have the same question. Um, I if I what if I've already completed my 30 and I plan to do a STEM camp or STEM workshop during summer? Would that count towards year two? That's a great question. So um, we have prevaricated about that all year because we did not know what it was going to look like. Um, and as we are coming up to the end of the year, the answer, unfortunately, is no. It was always our hope that you could start the summer with your PD and that would lead you into your year. But that is not going to be uh, something that we're going to be able to do. So all of the new PD will start in August. Year two will completely restart, refresh in August. I've got a quick question. Um, sure. I, st I started a robotics club at school and I'm doing a robotics slash STEM camp over the summer. Mm -hmm. And regardless of if, if I get accepted again or not, I plan to continue the robotics thing because it was a huge hit. Can I use that as my second year project or does it have to be something completely different? No, absolutely. You can continue that. Um, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have new challenges and new things that you're doing in year two, and you're going to build off what you've already created. And so you can absolutely use that for your project for year two. Yeah, we would not, you know, part of the, part of the intention of having this be a multi-year program is that, you know, we all know that trying to make any changes in our classrooms in just one year or with a program in just one year is, is challenging to say the least. So yes, please continue whatever you're doing. If it's worked for you and you want to continue it, if you don't, like if, if you thought, wow, I, I really hated this and none of my kids liked it either, that that's fine too. Like we all try things and like, uh, and so if it doesn't work out and you're like, well, let's try something different for year two, great. If you want to continue what you've been doing, fantastic. Yeah. Yay. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Anything else? Oh, new candidates for year two. Uh, again, highly dependent on what our numbers look like at the end of July. Uh, we are going to be putting out a general application that allows other people to apply uh, because we are very hopeful that we will be able to take um, 25 or 50 new fellows, uh, but it wouldn't be a whole new batch of hundreds. It's, it's going to be a much, if we are able to take new people, it will be a much smaller batch for next year. Um, yeah. Are we supposed to be submitting our PD hours as we go? Yes. I'm going to let uh, Shala speak to that one if she's able. Uh, yes. Please submit um, your PDs in the form that I'm going to send in the chat as you go. And uh, one more thing if you are participating in a PD, 
if they didn't offer you a certificate of completion, please ask for it. Sometimes they just offer the certificate of completion just for the people who ask. Because we need this certificate of, I think I just send it to one person, to everybody. They just offer the certificate of completion to uh, somebody who is asking for it, not to everybody. Was I able to answer your question? So, Ms. Shala, if we haven't received an email about our PD and we've been submitting as we go, should we be worried? Because I've hit past 30, I think I'm at 36 hours that I've submitted. Would you please repeat your question? So you already have submitted 36 hours. Yeah, so, give or take 36 hours. So I might have missed one here or there, but I haven't received any emails saying that my PD, other than it's being submitted, like you get a receipt from the form. Um. I will send out when, you know, when we, we are checking your uh, PDs as we go for submitting milestone two, which is two lesson plans and 10 hour of PD. So if you, we send you an email that you have uh, fulfilled the milestone two. So in this case, you will know that you already have submitted. Then uh, we did another two approved lesson plans and another 20 hours of PD then you will receive an email that you have fulfilled milestone three. In this way, you will know that you already have completed your- uh, Thank you for clarifying hours. that, Shala. Yeah, otherwise, if you reach out to me, I will be happy to let you know how many hours you have submitted. Yeah, so so just to, cause I, I, sorry, I kind of interrupted there, but yeah, just um, the, when we are sending it out, if you have turned in 36 hours, but you haven't turned any lesson plans in, you probably have only received the receipts from the form. Um, and so, uh, you know, I can't, uh, those receipts from the former are, are, are pretty accurate because it's just uploading into a Google form. And so um, if you have those receipts from the form, if you received an email being like, yeah, successful submission, good job, and you're taking hours from our PD partners, you are totally fine. You should not be worried. So one question is, do we need 30 or 36? You just need 30. Oh, uh, here is a... Um, here is an, a, a note from Mike, and it says, um, we, uh, so we have been, uh, the University Office of Educational Effectiveness, and then another E, something in there, um, has been sending out the surveys, and the, the challenge that we had with these early on is that the surveys and the this university office was not ready when you guys started taking some of the most early PDs. Anybody who took anything in November, December, or January, they just they just weren't ready. Um, and so they've been sent out after the fact. Now, every time you go to a PD from one of our partners at this point, they should be posting it at the end of the session, uh, which is a QR code for you to go and take a survey about the PD that you went to. It is extremely important that you fill these out for us. We really, really, really appreciate it because we need, you know, just, just for a certain level of, of statistical effectiveness, we need to have a certain number of people fill these out. Otherwise, they, they're, they're statistically kind of useless for us. So we really need everybody to fill these out. These help us know, you know, whether or not, uh, the, the PD was useful for you, whether, you know, it's worth us funding them again for next year. We've also sent out a separate Google form to sort of get some ideas back from you um, that everybody uh, should have seen and hopefully turned in at this point. So hopefully covering how effective your PDs were from kind of two different angles, but please make sure that um, if you have uh, if you see any of those emails from UOEEE, uh, and they're 
honestly, their website or their email address looks a little spammy. So just let's just keep an eye out for those. Uh, if you receive any of those, please fill them out for the PDs that you've gone to. It's it's really important. Uh, I think I skipped a bunch of questions here, but um, anybody else for Jonathan? I don't know how much time you have, um, but I can hang around for a little while later. Are there any other questions about lesson plans? So we can let Jonathan go if he needs to. No, I have a few minutes. People still have more questions um, about the lesson plans. or anything. Any questions about lesson plans or anything? Um, where can I find the contact information for, like I have emails from Shala so I can call her back. Uh, I can message her, email her, but is there a certain place where I can find the email information, contact information for all the, all the people in charge like Jonathan or anybody else? Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, Jonathan did a great job. Again, thank you so much to him and all the work that he does on this. We really appreciate him as well. <laughs> I'm in, I'm enjoying the the variety and interesting nature of the lesson plans. They've really been coming from a, a whole different you know angle. I, I taught science and STEM for 15 years, but it's different when you teach in a maker space and all you do all day is STEM. So seeing how teachers are integrating it into their current content has been really interesting. I've been enjoying it. Well, um, I'll say that it's five o'clock now, and I think. Uh... The, the three or four of us are going to be able to hang around for a while, but, you know, it's great to see you guys. It's great to talk to you. Um, and, you know, uh, if you have any other questions about lesson plans, feel free to email Jonathan. If you have any questions about PD, uh, go ahead and email Shala and, um, you know, just want to chat, <laughs> you know, we're always around. So um, we can hang around and answer questions for a while here. And, um, but I hope everybody has a great evening and um, I hope you, I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody else. Thanks. Hmm. Amanda? Yeah. I have a question and I put it in the chat, but then I had to go to the restroom because I'm still at school. So oh, I'm no. not sure if you answered that question, but I received a letter regarding I've been buying my supplies, but I haven't. I keep just beginning to cash my check because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Sure. I thought buying stuff before I got the check and then I put the check away. And if I got a letter saying it's not cashed, um, uh, something, do you know what I'm talking about? Something yes. like that. Uh, okay. Yeah. If yeah. I go so, home today and put it in my bank, am I still good or should I tell them that to rewrite me another check? I think you're still good. I'm going to ask Shala to confirm on that one. She can still cash it, right, Sh Shala? 